Great. Um, welcome to today's program, everybody. My name is Adam Desjardins, and I'm the programs manager at Culture Source. Um, for those of you who might be new to Culture Source, we are an arts service organization um, working to serve the arts and cultural sector of Southeast Michigan. Um, we do this work with over 175 member organizations, ranging from large art museums to small neighborhood grassroots arts organizations. Um, we also work with um, we also work with um, lots of artists, um, collectives, and unincorporated arts activity. Um, we do this work through three pillars. One is convenings, like this one that you're at today online, hopefully at home. Um, we do this also through funding, uh, re-granting opportunities, and then also um, research um, to better understand trends and opportunities in the field um, in our arts and cultural sector here in Southeast Michigan. Um, today, you are at a program that is a part of a representational justice residency um, with Simone Eccleston. Um, this program is called Beyond Images, Representational Justice in the Arts. Um, we're super excited to have Simone here with us today online. Um, we originally wanted to bring her back in, um, when was it, June, um, in person, but unfortunately, you know, things change as we've learned this year, and we're excited to have her here on our computer screens. Um, she is the Director of Hip Hop and Contemporary Music at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. She's the first person in this role in bringing an important historical performing arts legacy to the Kennedy Center, which is the nation's performing arts center. She's doing a really amazing job and we're super excited to have her here, um, if I haven't said it enough. Um, this whole representational justice residency is um, inspired by Aperture Magazine's um, Vision and Justice issue from 2015. Um, it's guest edited by Sarah Lewis from Harvard University. And it's just a really wonderful, beautiful testament to um, what photography means for the Black experience, what it has meant, what it continues to mean, and what it means for the future, too. What does representation mean in terms of capturing images of life, understanding people, and getting to know folks for who they are, and how, to, how does that create change, too? Um, so just to read a really quick quote um, from Sarah Lewis um, in her opening essay um, that I just think is really beautiful. The gravity of this connection between vision and justice is crucial to understand as we live in a polarized climate in the United States. Sociologists tell us that people now congregate, live, worship, play, and learn with those like themselves more than ever before. Save for constructed societies, we come into close contact with those who do not share our political and religious views less and less. How we remain connected depends on the function of pictures, increasingly the way, the, the way we process worlds unlike our own. The tool we marshal to cross our gulf is irrevocably altered vision. The imagination inspired by aesthetic encounters can get us to the point of benevolent surrender, making way for a new version of our collective selves. I just love that quote because it talks about connectivity and, um, and collectivity too. And how are we thinking about that in terms of when we're representing people, who we're representing, who we're with, how we're with people and what does it mean um, you know, for us as a whole? I think you know, Sarah Lewis wrote this five years ago, but I just think it still rings true, especially as we think about being online, being connected, what does that mean? Um, and so this whole residency um, is coming to a close with today's program and then also another program, um, our CEO roundtable from 3.30 to 4.30. So have folks join in um, at your organization who are in leadership. Um, to the CEO Roundtable because we can't get enough of Simone and we hope that you'll join in and listen to her and talk about a little bit more about her experience on being onboarded at the Kennedy Center and what that was like. Um, next week, we'll also be sharing out blog posts, um, commission blog posts on representational justice um, from some leaders in our region, as well as the playlists from the past two programs that we did, um, Life in Five, um, which are some really great hip hop playlists. I've personally been listening to a lot of MC Light since the one yesterday, which has been a true blessing. Um, this whole um, residency is in partnership with Masco. We're super thankful for their support in supporting the re online residency with Simone. And we just wanna give another thank you to our partners who support us in supporting Southeast Mich Michigan's arts and cultural sector. Um, so a huge thank you to them as well. Um, without further ado, here's a really wonderful photo of Simone. I'm going to pass it over to Executive Director of Culture Source, Amari Rush, and we'll get this show on the road. Great. Thanks so much, Adam, for that introduction and kind of setting the table for us all. And thank you all for being with us, all uh, everyone who's in the room, um, and certainly to our speakers who we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. But um, I do just want to echo Adam's remarks about you know, representational justice at Culture Source, you know, we are looking at a variety of ways um, 
administrative ways, programmatic ways, service ways to um, really embody our values, um, our guiding principles um, that have us be thoughtful about how we speak clearly, respectfully and inclusively uh, related to how we elevate voices historically oppressed by privilege, how we embrace contemporary culture at its core and edges. And, um, and as we were thinking about, you know, in 2020, how to continue to live within those guiding principles and explore them. And um, as I thought about people who I just really admire, um, Simone came to mind pretty quickly. And so um, I'm really thrilled to have her with us as we explore this idea, as we launch this uh, ongoing long-term exploration of this idea of representational justice and, um, and the ways in which representation matters and the ways in which we can all be thoughtful about uh, narratives that we create, narratives that we share, um, that have power to um, continue to humanize people, that continue to um, affirm the potential of our neighbors and our family members to be um, bright lights in the world, and, um, and just live in that, celebrate it, maximize it, all those things. And we really believe in the work that Simone is doing at the Kennedy Center as the director of hip hop culture and contemporary music as a great example of that. And so we're here today to, um, to talk through that. Um, so again, thank you, Simone, for being with us. Um, and I do just wanna again, echo this, um, uh, this uh, partnership that we have with MASCO. Um, you know, uh, they have themselves as a, as a company corporation really committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, you know, as I was talking with them um, about our goals at Culture Source for the Southeast Michigan uh, cultural sector and uh, what they're interested in, um, this emerged as just a really smart, thoughtful um, way to partner. And so I very much appreciate their support and uh, so does our board and staff. So just another kind of shout out to Masco as well as all of the, the partners that we have um, in funding and programs in, um, in thinking who help us do this work. So with that, um, I'll uh, introduce Simone, but I'll actually uh, do that first by showing a quick video that gives a sense of some of the energy of her work. Thanks so much for that, uh, for that share, Adam um, and Simone. Thanks for sharing that video. We will drop a link into the chat so you can view that again and, um, and move and enjoy uh, this block party that Simone organized. Um, Simone, thanks for being with us. What was that that we just saw? Thank you so much for having me, Amari. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a joy to be with you. It's day three, and so it's time to really dig in. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that clip. It was from our hip hop block party, which happened uh, last September as we celebrated the opening of The Reach, which is our new expansion campus at the Kennedy Center. And so we had about, uh, I guess, 10 days of programming uh, in which the hip hop block party, you know, it celebrated the various tenets of the culture, you know, and it's like the work that hip hop generation creators um, have, have done. And so it was like this beautiful celebration of community, of the culture, of the art. And so, um, you know, we had about 10,000 people there that day. And it was just a beautiful way to, to really highlight hip hop and its impact within the context of our local and national landscape. Mm -hmm. So, um, so again, thanks for sharing that. It looked uh, looked like a lot of fun, and I know that the the reach was um, an initiative and, ex and an expansion uh, long in the making. So it's great to see that um, everybody was um, really maximizing the opportunity to have fun. Um, but Simone, if we could, you know, just back up a second, and could you talk us through how hip hop became um, came to be a, a focus area for the Kennedy Center? Yes, of course. Um, so I will take this moment to give a shout out to uh, the work of our community engagement team, um, because it actually came out of their work for about, it was over like a decade and a half, right? So they had partnered with uh, the Hip Hop Theater Festival that is currently known as High Arts to present the DC Hip Hop Theater Festival. And in about 2014, 
Uh, they presented One Mic Hip Hop Culture Worldwide, a three week festival that celebrated uh, the various elements of the culture, um, as well as the work of like, uh, work that's created from hip hop generation creators. And so that three week festival was a tremendous success. It also included um, the collaboration between Nas and the NSO, which I think many of you have seen. If not, I highly recommend it. You know, it was featured as part of like PBS American Masters um, and it also lives live on Apple. And so, you know, like that was definitely like one of the first tipping points for the organization. And then in 2015, the NSO collaborated with Kendrick Lamar to do the first live presentation of To Pimp a Butterfly. And it was the success of like the decades of work in the seeds that, you know, the community engagement team planted, I think compounded by, you know, like the success of One Mic and the NSO collaboration with Kendrick that really helped the institution see that it was time to do something more. Right? And so when we talk about the Kennedy Center, it is the nation's performing arts center. So it should be reflective of the nation. It's the home to classical forms like the opera and you know, the symphony and ballet, but it also you know, is the home to more contemporary forms like jazz, which is one of America's indigenous art forms, right? So with that being said, it, I think it was imperative of us as an institution to create space for hip hop to have a home at the center because it is one of America's greatest art forms. You know, it is a gateway to culture. It has served as one of our primary ambassadors. And so, you know, when we're thinking about like who we, who we were in that moment, and I think, you know, like we, we had, we had new leadership come into play in 2015. And so, you know, our president, Deborah Rutter, and our um, SVP of artistic planning, Robert Van Leer, you know, like they were really open to the idea of like, what does it mean when we take hip hop out of community engagement and actually have it as a programming anchor within the context of our institution? That speaks volumes because that demonstrates another level of commitment. And so, you know, I think that both in terms of our, the realization of who we are and our aspiration as an organization in terms of being reflective of the nation, being a, a 21st century performing arts uh, organization and just making sure that, you know, that we live up to the, to the John F. Kennedy quote that genius can speak in any tongue in the world will hear it and listen, right? What we know is that hip hop is emblematic of genius. And so it was only fitting that hip hop had a home at the center. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and Simone, if you could, would, you, you talked about this um, hip hop being reflective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you and I had some gloriously rambly uh, conversations about all of this. And one of the things that struck me is, is that you, you were, <laughs> you were very, um, you talked about the intentionality around it not necessarily being primarily corrective. This wasn't about leaning into kind of past injustice or about, about really thinking about the way that other people viewed um, Black people or the way that other people viewed hip hop or anything like that. Can you say some a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it, when we're thinking about like hip hop as a culture, as an art form, you know, as a community or a nexus of communities, you know, it has, like I said before, it has and continues to be emblematic of genius, right? So it was birthed out of, you know, necessity, out of resistance, out of, you know, genius and ingenuity. And so I think you know, when we're thinking about it historically and even through this day, it has provided voice and visibility for people, you know, for people like myself, you know, it's like we find ourselves, you know, in the songs of our favorite MCs, you know, or think about the kind of possession that our B-boys and B-girls have, or, you know, what our right in terms of our writers, in terms of graffiti, you know, it's like staking that claim we are here. So, you know, like I think about um, the, the note that Sarah Lewis has, you know, when she comments on her grandfather. And, you know, it's about inserting ourselves where we know that we should and like do exist. And so, you know, when we're thinking about the culture and this is not about 
being corrective. It's more about us kind of just owning our space. And I think, you know, in regards to the institution, you know, like our role was not, in, in regards to having hip hop as a programmatic anchor, it was not about, okay, this is the Kennedy Center and we are now kind of like opening our doors to hip hop, you know, and so kind of it operating underneath a traditional paradigm. Like it's like, no, in this moment, we understand our place in the ecosystem. We need to decenter ourselves as an authority and take the lead from those that are. And so when we think about the building of the program, you know, the institution announced, you know, its formal commitment to hip hop culture in 2016. And as part of that, they brought in Q-Tip as our inaugural artistic director. And he is the legend, icon, pioneer, you know, in the culture. And so we're so grateful, but it's, and they brought me in in about 2017. And so, one of the first things that we did once I got there, you know, like for him, he's committed to not, to ensuring that it's not about him, right? It's about the culture and it's about the people. So what he wanted to do was create an opportunity for us to build this program in fellowship with others. So we created the Kennedy Center Hip Hop Culture Council, right? And so that includes 23 individuals that range from artists, producers, um, activists, journalists, scholars, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful constellation of people, but they help us to create this program. And so like, they've been extremely kind of, they've been co-conspirators, they've served as thought partners, they've held us accountable in many ways, you know, to ensure that we make sure that we fulfill on our commitment to the culture and also make sure that it is accurately reflected and portrayed, you know? So I think that when we think about the building of this program, it is not about correction, it is about reflection and also understanding that if we want to look towards the future, we have to look to the individuals and the communities that will take us there and hip hop is just that. Yes, um, great, thank you. And you did that really horrible thing where you said a bunch of things that made me want to go in this direction and that direction. So now I have to choose which which question to ask next. But I will say, uh, <laughs> uh, because we're going to try to keep it slightly more linear for the, the viewing public um, okay. than Simone and Omar normally go. Um, Simone, could you, could you just say a, a little bit more about what that reflection looks like, like programmatically? Mm -hmm. What are you all up to? What's on stage? What's mm -hmm. not necessarily on stage that's related? Um, what is, what, yeah, what does the program look like? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, our, so when it's an annual season, right? And so when we're thinking about what our season looks like, it's a mix of performances, humanities events that can range from films to book talks to listening sessions. Um, we have dance parties because, you know, it's like dance is an integral part of the culture. And we also need to think about our liber like our liberatory practices. You know, it's like when you can get free on the dance floor, that is also a part of our liberation and resistance, right? right. And so I think, you know, it's like, and it also helps us to celebrate the genius of our DJs, you know, it's like in their ability to, um, to essentially rock a party more or less. But, you know, it's like thinking about all of those things. So it's like our, our season is basically performances, humanities events, um, and other ways in which we can engage the public. But then that's the external facing, right? And then internally, I think because, you know, the culture is relatively new to the institution, clearly there's, there are also conversations that need to happen, right? So like one of the things that happened when I first started was, you know, sharing a monthly newsletter, right? Because it's like, you also have to build knowledge, right? And so being able to provide information on, you know, what our council members were up to or important things happening within the culture that would have resonance within the institution, like all of those things are like the small deposits you make as you work towards transformation. The way that we're also structured, you know, it's like we have pods that kind of run across departments, whether it's marketing, PR, development. And so, you know, as part of our pod meetings, we talk about the business and the task at hand, 
But then we'd also have moments where we just talked about culture. We talked about something that dropped. We talked about something, you know, like maybe an issue that was happening within the community that needed to be addressed. But it's like we created space for conversations that allowed us to dig a little deeper. Um, and so, you know, like I think about that and then also just having moments where like we would bring the council in and they would be or having artists come in and talk to our leadership. So it's like thinking about there's the external work that engages the public, but then there's also the internal work within the context of the institution as you work to institute and, you know, like socialize new forms or contemporary forms within the center because not everybody's going to have a background or knowledge for it. You know, Simone, it's so, um... I'm so glad that you brought that up because, I mean, very directly, I, as I asked that question, I was really just thinking about the external, but it's so important, this internal dimension, right? That, um, that the, a, a culture, um, our culture around the art and the work grows externally and internally so that it all works together, right? Um, yeah, that's super solid. Um, in terms of the the vision, like when you think about those internal partners and and what people at all different levels of the and corners of the organization are thinking about the work, um, I guess I wonder what what the sense of the 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 vision is. And part of the reason why I think about this is because of you know what we've all recognized and seen as the power of image to really affect and drive change. We think about how videos of um, violence against black people has really started, ignited, reignited movements. Um, killing of black people has, you know, done that. Um, I think about Emmett Till, I think about George Floyd. Um, I even think about, you know, I was talking with our staff team about, I was listening to an NPR story about um, the, um, uh, Native American Congresswoman, Deb Haviland, who is on the short list for becoming the Secretary of the Department of Interior. Mm -hmm. And just like, what does it mean to have a Native American woman as the person in our country who's over all the land? I mean, essentially, right? It's like, it's like tingly power, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what is, when you all think about the tingly power that you are, um, kind of giving space to or trying to connect with, what's your kind of vision of what it will ultimately do, what it'll shift, what change it'll spark? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that ultimately the vision really is about transformation, right? Um, and I think, you know, like key questions that I ask when like when I'm in conversation with our artistic director or when I'm in conversation with an artist, it's just like, how will we be better because you were here? How will we be different, right? To have that as the guiding prompt. And so, you know, when we're thinking about hip hop and its role at the center, it's like, how are we better? Because hip hop was, is present at the Kennedy Center. How are we different? You know, it's like, how are we taking, you know, whether we're thinking about call and response, whether we're thinking about the art of like uh, improvisation, whether we're thinking about what it means, you know, when we're thinking about the art of sampling, <clears throat> what happens when we take those aesthetics and model that within the context of our work as an institution, right? Um, and so I think it's like thinking about those things um, as one stream, right? But then I also, hope that, you know, based on the work that we're able to do, that people really understand the genius of the culture, you know, and its practitioners and the communities that created it, you know, because when I think, you know, it's like, I just think about like me growing up and it's like, I'm in a black and Latino community. And it's like, it's, it's just like the, um, the energy and the vibration, all of that is, is just so incredible in the ingenuity. And so it's like when I like when I think about my work, ultimately it is about celebrating the intellectual and creative genius of people of color, right? And ensuring that, you know, it's like when we're thinking about this work, that people understand our genius, that people understand our intellect. And this is not a, uh, and I think are able to 
revel in it, right? Like, it's like, it, it is not me having to prove my humanity to you. It is not about me proving my genius, but it is about creating the space where our genius is held and celebrated. And if it, you know, like, it's like for us, when we see ourselves reflected, that's powerful. For other people, they may get present to it, right? But it's like allowing it to just, to exist and continue to, I think, evolve and multiply. Like what happens when we allow, not allow, not allow. I don't like to use that phrase, mm -hmm. but like what happens when, when we just allow genius to occupy every facet, every hall, every space within the context of our institution. So when I think about, so when I think about, um, <laughs> This, I know, I know, I know, I know, I'm sorry. I know this is, I knew this is going to happen. Go, 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 go. All right. So when I think about kind of like the things in terms of vision, right? Transformation is one of them. Genius is the other. And I think that it is also understanding the, the kind of the breadth of the culture, right? Because it's like within, you know, like our artists, they're multi hyphenates. You know what I'm saying? Like someone is, you know, like you, you're both or you're like an MC, you are a actor, you are, you know, engaged in community. And so it's like, we want to create space for people to exist in the fullness of who they are, right? And so I think that when we're able to do that with artists, we're also able to do that with our audiences. We want people to feel like they can come and show up in jeans and sneakers. And that is just as celebrated as someone who is in our space in a tux, right? Because it, it's just about that human connection. And I think, you know, it's like being able to see ourselves powerfully reflected on stage as part of our education program, Kennedy Center Honors, all of those things are powerful ways in which, you know, it's like there's the visuals in which it is impressed upon you, right? And so it's like being able to see you know, images over time helps to impress certain messages. And I think that we've done a great job of like documenting the program in terms of photos and, and video, right? To be able to tell that story. But when we're also talking about representation, this goes back to the formation of the program, right? It's like in shifting it out of community engagement and making it an anchor program within the context of the center, that is an infrastructural, that is like representational justice in, as it relates to infrastructure. Then having an AD that is of the culture, right? A pioneer in the culture, that is representative justice. Having the council, representative justice. An annual season versus a one-off event, representational justice. It is how it is built into the infrastructure of who we are as an organization. And hopefully that will help us achieve our vision of transformation, genius in the center, you know, like all of those things. So hopefully mm -hmm. I was able to kind of tie that in for you, Mark. Does that work? <laughs> no, it was, it, no, it's great, it was great. And you know, but Simone, we're, as you were starting to tie it in, it touched on one of the things that, that we're thoughtful about. And that is that, it's not just the one thing, but it's the suite of activities. It's the comprehensive commitment that mm -hmm. comes with being thoughtful about <clears throat> staffing choices, advisory choices, language choices. I mean, this idea that you are stumbling over the use of the word allow, you know, um, and what that, um, the connotations that come with that, you know, we've talked about, um, that this is not about an authorizing event. You know, this isn't about, you know, dubbing like this good and this um, this tolerable, all these things. And so, um, you know, it's one of the, it's one of the, the really neat things about this, um, this enterprise, right? This enterprise of, of really exploring hip hop institutionally is that you get to explore all the, the complexity around it. And, um, and that is the thing. And so as we think about <clears throat> you know, representation, um, we want to get into the weeds. We want to get a little messy and, and dirty and think about, yeah, how do, we, how do we think about representation that is respectful? How do we think about representation that, is, um, that has a truth at a certain, you know, that, that embodies truth? And then, well, who's truth? And, in what ways does that matter? There's all these questions. And so part of what I loved about what you just talked through was that it just unpacked a lot of that, um, a lot of that complexity and you all's awareness of some of the things that you're trying to get at in, um, in shifting narratives 
in um, in continuing to um, um, broadly define genius, you know? Yeah, and I mean, it's like, what we know is that like hip hop doesn't need us to co-sign, you know, it's like the culture doesn't need us to co-sign, <laughs> you know, like it's mm-hmm. like, so I think that that's the key thing. And it's like understanding that it is not, this is not about quote unquote elevation, right? Because the genius of hip hop stands on par with all things, you know? And I think it is just making sure that we create an opportunity for people to have pathways in. Simone, I have, before um, I bring in um, our guest, I have one quick question for you. I threw in quick just to poke a little fun at both of us. Um, And that is, if you think, is there an artist who comes to mind who is being very thoughtful about the um, the opportunities to shift narratives specifically through their art, um, to affect change through their art? Um, mm-hmm. Is there someone that comes to mind that's doing that in hip hop, um, as opposed to somebody that's just like exploring pure musicality or is just, is looking at a social dimension of the work because that's what they're really into? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are, there's so many, <laughs> right? There's so many. Um, and I, you know, like, it's like, I'll pull on two council members in this moment. And so, you know, I think Common is always doing something, right? And so he just released uh, a new project, uh, A Beautiful Revolution, uh, not too long ago. And that clearly continues to be like a soundtrack for the movement. But beyond that, he's also doing work regarding prison reform and anti-recidivism. And so it's like, you know, like he's always going to be like a go-to in regards to an artist who has aligned themselves with social justice, the movement of the people and our liberation, right? So he's one. Um, I would also say, you know, like Black Thought released uh, Cain and Abel, Streams of Thought, volume three, Cain and Abel. And, you know, it's it's critique of colonialism, white supremacy, you know, it's just like, it is so powerful. And I think that if you're able to kind of Um, check out the video Thought Versus Everybody, there's this beautiful constellation of just like black excellence and black genius. And, you know, and it it really is like a movement piece, right? But then there's also like the unapologetic nature of hip hop where he's like, it's me versus everybody, you know, it's like, and so, but, but that's, but that's the nature. Like, you know, it's like, we stand in resistance, you know, like we stand in full ownership of ourselves. And I think that that, has been the thing that has helped us, you know, as we are kind of like approach the 50th anniversary of the culture, like that has been the thing that has sustained us. So, you know, I think that those are two uh, very prime kind of like folks to kind of look to at the moment. Great, thank you for that. And I will just acknowledge that you just dropped in that, like as we approach the 50th anniversary of the culture, blah, 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 and just kind of moved on. We will come back to that and what that means and and how we how we got to that number 50. But, um, but I do want to uh, take this opportunity to bring in some additional voices from within the Southeast Michigan region um, to just, you know, offer some reflections on what we've, talked about, offer some reflections on hip hop culture, on representational justice, on a variety of things. And I would first um, invite Tina Olson to join us with a video on. Um, Tina is the director of the University of Michigan Museum of Art and co-chair of the University of Michigan's Emerging uh, Arts Initiative. Tina, welcome and thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. And I'm really inspired by the conversation that you and Simone have been having. So there's like, like you earlier said, Omari, there's so many threads to pick up on. Um, but I thought I would sort of point out some maybe, maybe obvious and also subtle differences, like similarities and differences between how some of, some of what you've touched on has been playing out in the art museum sphere. Um, And I think that's pretty interesting, like ways that there's real overlaps and then ways that there really aren't. And so I think that a lot of my, a lot of the audience probably knows that there's been a huge um, years in the making conversation within art museum world land about representation Um, and representation as that means what's on the walls and what's not and who's on the wall and who's not. Um, And we see it sort of the most obvious 
examples are everything from when MoMA expanded in New York and chose to really rethink um, its galleries and what um, and what and who was in who was on those walls and included many more artists of color and many more women artists and also acknowledged for the first time really physically literally that there wasn't a single canon of of modern art um, of Western art um, that there couldn't be and therefore to Simone's points about like what's on the program and what's in sort of you know the edges and community um, engagement like they couldn't no longer have a single narrative and then a few galleries along the sides that would have things that were changing like they've got to change their galleries all the time because there isn't a narr one narrative there's multiple narratives so I think that question about like you know about narrative maybe um, is one that we could we could talk um, keep talking about um, you know I think in in the art museum world, there has been a lot of thinking in particular about um, American art and what's American and who's American. Mm -hmm. And that has led to, you know, changes like um, a month or so ago when the Met acknowledged and announced its first ever Native American curator. It had, it had never had one because the American art galleries at the Met just didn't, they just didn't include Native American art, right? And so like, just think about that for a moment. Like, what do we, who's in that, who's under that umbrella? Who's in that? What do we mean? And how do we define um, American? Um, you know, I'd say in museums, there has also been a kind of, a, you know, a, a broadening of, of genre and media. And so, you know, I was really interested in, in Simone's points about really not being, um, being celebratory and broadening, um, broadening the field without it feeling um, finger wagging, because I think in the museum world it's it has felt much more much more like there has been a historic hierarchy of which genre or media are on the top, and those and the top ones are the things on the wall, paintings, um, and others have not been there. You know, so textile art has not been in museums um, traditionally craft has not been, but you see things like, you know, um, Crystal Bridges, which has for the first time now a curator of craft, right? So Crystal Bridges is a, is a canonical American art institution and now has a dedicated person um, for craft. Um, Berkeley Art Museum just received a really um, incredible uh, gift of, um, of very important American, uh, African-American quilts um, now has a dedicated curator for that collection would never have happened years ago. So I think, so I think like you see the similarities that I see are things like absolutely the sense that, you know, Bronx Museum now has a social justice curator like to, to Simone's point about that shift that would have been a side, you know, education, community engagement kind of role. And now it's at the center as a, as a curatorial position that is ongoing. So that idea of things that are, that had been peripheral or had been episodic coming to the center and being in the program and in the ongoing program in the galleries, not just a public program or not just a temporary program is one that I see play out. I see, I see real similarities. Um, but I'd say one of the differences is something else that, that you all touched on, which is I think the art museum conversation has a strong feeling and sense of absolutely being corrective to use that word. Um, art museums, um, especially encyclopedic museums simply do have deep histories that are inherently racist and colonialist. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get around that, you know, collections, whole collections came by way of theft, um, came by way of colonialist expansion. Um, and so they have had to grapple with that um, and figure out what to do about that, maybe in ways that are different. I think that would be an interesting thing for us all to talk about, maybe. So, you know, I have many conversations with colleagues that are sort of a version of like, do we repair it? Can we repair this this thing that we're that that we've inherited, or just do we have to throw it away and like start again? Um, a kind of like, can this foundation that is so um, painful, um, immoral in some cases, um, be built on, um, or do, or is it, or do the do the institution, the future art museum institutions, really need a different 
a different history, a different beginning. Um, so that's like maybe something that we could that we could talk um, or think more about. I mean, the other thing that I was that I was interested in, um, and that maybe you all will want to um, talk about too, is sort of the question of what happens in the building and what doesn't, um, and what that means, and how how you bring a form or forms that were really intended for a different form factor or a different space and what it means to bring them in. And, you know, nearly all the art in art museums was intended for a different form. Maybe that's true at, at, at you know, maybe that's as true in musical, um, in, a, in a place like the Kennedy Center. And so we, all, we often think about that. Like maybe this can't be inside. Maybe this has to be outside. Maybe this has to be, like we, Omari and I were talking when I just got on about the fact that we just got this giant gift of monumental public art that sits outside the museum. It could never be inside the museum. That's sort of an obvious version. But I wonder to what extent, Simone, like that is a tension um, with hip hop. Does it, does it feel and look and act? And is it a totally this different thing when you bring it into a Kennedy Center or not? Um, the same way when we bring you know, African-American quilts um, and stick them in the Berkeley Art Museum, like what does that mean for them? What does it mean for their viewership for how you take them in. Um, so maybe I'll leave it at that because I know that that there's a lot on that, a lot of meat on that bone. There, is. <laughs> there you go, there you go, Tina, asking meaty questions. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for that, um, that response and reflection. And I just got to give um, a bit of a shout out. I, if, I think I have the facts correct, but the first exhibition that you um, curated at UMA um, was one of um, uh, art by Black artists um, in the kind of Black power era, age, and um, the kind of centerpiece from my perspective was this Sam, work by Sam Gilliam, who I absolutely love. And um, it just felt so good um, walking into UMA and seeing that just like right there front and center. But also curiously, Tina, and I'm going to, you know, pull out my bag of, um, of worms, that offers up a whole nother set of questions around representation. That is when the work is abstract and when you don't necessarily see the artist standing yeah. next to their, their piece yeah. or their, um, their sound creation. How does, what does all that mean? Um, so, um, so thank yeah. you for that gift. <laughs> yeah, that was a really, really great show to put together. It was mm -hmm. all work that had been made within like 1970 to 71. So it was an incredible drape work by Sam Gilliam, a work by a Michigan artist, Al Loving, who went to Michigan and then went on to New York and had a big career. And then two um, uh, women artists, women artists, um, Frankenthaler um, and Nevelson. And all of them struggling with this question of like, how do you make abstract work if you're not the canonical white man? Can you? And could you then? Because it was a it was a vocabulary and a and a language that was so gendered as male um, and gendered as high art and gendered as as institutional. So for a black artist to claim it, or even for a woman artist in those years, was like a big radical, hard thing. And they all got. SHIT for it. Like they all got, you know, a lot of critics came down on all four of them um, for making that work at that time. So that was really what it was about, like abstract art and, and who gets to make it, especially in the early 70s. Yeah. Thanks for that, Tina. Um, Yuval Sharon, I'll ask you to, to join, um, join us on, on screen now as well. Yuval, as the uh, the new artistic director of the uh, Michigan Opera Theater. Um, you all, you clearly are not in Michigan because, because right. otherwise you would be bundled <laughs> up. You would not be in short sleeves uh, enjoying some remote work. But um, I wonder that. if you might um, wait. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, hey, I'd be there um, right there alongside you. Um, I but, need the fake uh, Zoom backdrop of the, like snow and, and <laughs> Michigan. Yeah. Well, and this is coming from a uh, born and raised Florida native, Tallahassee, Florida. So, um, so your vibe right now is where my heart really <laughs> is um, biologically. Um, but you all, I wonder if you might um, 
share your own reflections about the dialogue that um, Simone and I were having, the dialogue that we were then having with Tina, um, and how all that intersects with your own, um, your work, and really your vision for um, MOT. Yeah, very happily, and thank you so very much for inviting me uh, to, to be part of this conversation. Um, Simone, it was just amazing to hear you speak about the work you're doing uh, at the Kennedy Center. And um, Tina, I'm, um, there's so much that I'd love to respond to. I, I'll just uh, um, very quickly, maybe just uh, just so that we can have a little bit of dialogue, just uh, some thoughts that, that came to me, especially for people that might not think of opera as an art form that uh, has much to say about what it is that we're discussing as a group. Um, I'd like to say it is a challenge for an art form like opera that we do that is in many ways inherently a colonialist art form, an art form that is uh, an imposition uh, on America from Europe. And in many ways, the pieces that still get done in most American opera companies are French, Italian, German, English repertoire. So there is this kind of feeling that this, uh, that, that colonialism is still uh, happening uh, in real time or the remnants of colonialism are still very much the guiding principles of most operatic institutions. Now there's been, um, there's been certainly uh, for the last hundred years and, and, and in recent time, uh, in, an increased interest in uh, opera as an American art form from with American voices and all of what that means about, about uh, a more just representation of what America is about. But I like to think about it a little bit, uh, especially um, Simone and what you were saying, um, thinking about it just a little bit in terms of um, the, the idea that how does culture, where does culture really originate from? Is it something that is administered from top down? I think most people think of opera like that, or is it something that emerges from the ground up? And is it something that does come from the street and be the, as, as Simone put it, kind of the, the genius of the moment or the genius of that particular, uh, of that particular, the, the sounds of the street, the sounds of a community, um, the, the sounds of a city. And I personally have been much more interested in that second view of how culture sort of arises and this opportunity with Michigan Opera Theater is very exciting to me because it's a chance to really think about how does an institution like Michigan Opera Theater um, maybe realign itself so that it is not just seeming to be a from the ground up organization, but actually is a from the ground up kind of organization, meaning who is writing the pieces, who is starring in it. I mean, to me, that, that is pretty easy, but who's working backstage? Who's on the board? Who's on the staff? Uh, how is it every aspect of who we are uh, representing the real soul of Detroit? And again, that is something that might seem slightly different uh, than what most people think of with opera when they think of uh, a kind of universalist approach that uh, a certain opera is exactly the same in Detroit as it is in New York, as it is in, in DC. Um, instead, I would love opera that happens in Detroit to be instantly recognizable as a kind of only in Detroit uh, phenomenon. And I think that means, you know, thinking about, um, uh, you know, narrative strategies and musical strategies from hip hop. You know, I'm thinking about my friend, um, the cultural uh, critic and writer, Josh Kuhn, who wrote a lot about crossfading and what that means about when, when, when DJs crossfade between two different tracks, that there is this hybrid moment between the two tracks that in a way um, can capture something that isn't one thing or another. And I find that an incredibly beautiful way to think about opera too, because opera is this melding of all the different genres. It's something that isn't theater, it isn't concert, it isn't architecture, it isn't choreography. It's this fade, it's, it's a crossfade in a way between all of those things. Um, that's how I would like to start thinking about opera. I'd love to think about remixing operas. I'd love to think about shuffling operas. I'd love to think about inviting, uh, inviting artists from different disciplines uh, to be involved in this operatic uh, um, uh, edifice that we're creating. Um, so those are things that, that I'm sort of thinking about. Um, I haven't got to the in and out of the building uh, question, Tina, but you know, if, if that's of interest to the group, we can discuss that uh, all together. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be of interest to the group uh, <laughs> because I think both of you clearly have, have some, some interesting things to say about you all. Thanks for, for that. And Simone, I wonder, um, if you have any thought, I mean, now we're doing the 
the, what did you say? What did you say? What did you say? But I wonder if, if anything that you Valentina said um, struck you or resonated or um, if you have a response to their responses. Yeah, I mean, I think that they're, given where we are as a nation, there is a lot of corrective work, like repair work that needs to be done, right? There, and this is just to respond to what you've said, Tina, right? Um, and so, you know, there is repair work that needs to be done. And, I, and, you know, like there needs to be like that kind of just accountability and honesty that happens around the ways in which we continue to marginalize and disenfranchise you know, communities, whether we're thinking about like, what does that mean in regards to our, to the artists that we present, the work that we present, the makeup of our staff, the way we allocate our budgets. You know, I think about, you know, even if I'm thinking about it in relationship to my, to like my own work and the hip hop culture program, our program isn't fully funded, right? And so if we're thinking, you know, to kind of harken back to um, uh, Amari's question about, like what's the vision for the future? One of the visions is actually having full funding to ensure that, because that means sustainability, right? That means a lot of, you know, it, it means the ability to grow our capacity, right? To implement our programming. It, it means that like we'd have more staff and hopefully more staff that is reflective of the culture, you know? So it's like thinking about all of the things that like can happen, but I think overall, like it's like, we definitely have to take a moment to, for, honest conversations about accountability and repair. And it's like, not just issue these anti-racist statements or this is what we're gonna do now because, you know, like, it's like, what does it mean? Like, what does that look like long-term, right? Like it is not creating a response for the moment, for the moment, but really about creating a vision for the long-term, a commitment for the long-term, an investment for the long-term. And so, you know, like, I just wanna make sure that it's like for the arts presenters that are listening, you know, that like when we're having these conversations about representational justice, it's like, what does that look like from an infrastructure perspective? What does that look like from a funding perspective? We need to have those kinds of conversations too, because it's not about optics. We're far beyond that at this moment. The times require something more, it, requires us to be greater and bigger than, you know, I think greater and bolder than we've been. Mm -hmm. Simone, thank, thanks for that. And I, I, I will say that one of the things that mm, with representational justice, I like fe people feeling very empowered to um, be an ally in kind of authentic narrative creation that mm -hmm they can do their own part in kind of um, in showing their neighbors, peers, coworkers to be humans that show up with joy and energy in their heart. Mm -hmm. And so that means, from my perspective, that can mean making changes that are like, well, we could choose this picture for our brochure or we could choose this picture. Like there's no, this is not like a large financial investment, um, but it just, highly intentional work. And so um, I will say that that is our um, kind of one of our perspectives on this focus. And it makes me think, you know, you've talked about the intentionality with which these conversations are being happening in, in the back office internally. And I guess I wonder, um, Tina and Yuval, like when you think about conversations that you're having, um, what do they look like? And, and how, how are you using this moment as a moment of um, ongoing conversation in a kind of a way that's moving toward progress? Um, question mark. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that Simone said it all. I mean, I think the question and the issue and the challenge is to sustain the work. So to be an anti-racist organization is not a like flavor of the month. It's not this summer's project. It's the institution's project and it is a deep fundamental value. So it has to get announced and then it has to get, and then you have to have commitments. And then those commitments are like, you work on every day and you work on forever, you know? And so I think that a lot, I think that a lot of people don't understand, you know, and there's a lot of work to do, right? There's the, the work of, um, of 
bringing along donors and edu I loved some of the some of the language you use, Simone, about like the I can't I don't have it right on my fingertips now, but the sort of slow drip of constant communication and bringing along and. So it's that work and it's your board and it's your staff and it's your program, um, you know, it's your acquisitions. We just had an acquisitions committee meeting um, with my, you know, with that committee of donors and it was only and exclusively about diversifying the collection and why we need to do that and what it looks like. And it was, we didn't buy anything. We didn't even talk about buying anything. We just talked about what that, what, like the powerful reason to do that and then what it will mean going forward and not just for one season. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think it's like a fundamental turn for many institutions. Um, and for those that for, for whom it isn't, you'll see the difference because they're, it's not a five minute project. Um, so. Yeah. You've all, any, any, any thoughts there? Yeah, um, it's actually something that, um, Simone, you had mentioned earlier, uh, I think a, a word that I like very much um, was decentering in terms yeah. of the institutional approach to things and realizing uh, that we need to decenter ourselves uh, and have the humility to decenter ourselves as we open, uh, we'll open up the, our, the platform for new voices to emerge. And I think that's an amazing way to think about the future. I think about it from the point of view, not just as the uh, artistic director of the organization, but as a director of projects, I like to think of the thing that I think really drew me to opera was its collaborative nature. And, and again, uh, maybe paradoxical when people think about opera, but something that is non-hierarchical that you actually try and create uh, uh, as level of a playing field as you possibly can within the, the creation of a work. Um, and uh, really allowing for, uh, you know, uh, allowing for that work to actually happen. I think that's something that I, that I am thinking about a lot, you know, and thinking about a lot when, when thinking about programming for Detroit and also for projects um, here in Los Angeles as well. And maybe um, Tina, to your point, to your question really, that is a, an ongoing question for me personally, but I think for the field of opera, uh, I think related to what, to what you're dealing with in the museum is can we, can we repair what we've inherited? Because in many ways, opera, you know, as, as much as there's new work being created, uh, there's a lot of inherited repertoire. And with that inherited repertoire comes a lot of inherited ideologies uh, and um, insidious uh, ideas that get, uh, per, per, you know, perpetuated, um, whether we like it or not. The advantage that opera might have over, uh, a visual art institution where there are fixed, uh, you know, fixed images, and uh, you know, a statue that in a way um, solidifies and crystallizes a certain ideology, is that opera, like like music, like theater, is a living art form and exists only in the moment, and that means that all of those questions of of representation, there's no reason to just regurgitate the past. There's always the opportunity to totally re-represent it, <laughs> re-represent if that's a word. Anyway, but to, yeah, sorry, Simona. Sure. Well, then I think maybe to just respond to what you're saying, then it's like, who are the new voices that you can bring in? Who, like, who are the artists that have been overlooked, you know, yeah. that can be brought to the table? So I think it's about creating space. You can have the honest conversation about the history. And I think that it's important that we do because too often we try to push history aside and act like everything's fine when it's like, no, until we have a real conversation about history, there's no way that we can like have the necessary apologies, reconciliation and create courses for action that allow for meaningful change, right? But it's like, have the conversation and then also like bring, bring folks to the table, provide them with the resources that they need. You know, who are the Black, Latinx, and Indigenous composers, you know, mm -hmm. that you need to bring to the table? Who are the, who, what's, you know, kind of like that, the next generation of curators, you know, like that you can bring to the table? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's thinking about it in, on all levels. And it's, you know, like, and I think at every kind of moment, the artist, the curators, the administrative team that helps to tell the story. Yeah. You know, it's like your development team. Everybody needs to kind of have a role and part in that conversation. And I think we have to shake it all up because yeah. like, you know, like we should, we should be able to go to any one of your organizations 
and see like diverse representation across the board not only in regards to race but in regards to gender and age yeah. you know like we have to kind of infrastructurally build the future that we want to see well um totally. simone, simone thanks for that and um you all i will put in a plug for you know an early project for you to figure out how to shake up as madam butterfly because um I, I need to continue to hear people sing Un Bel D. Um, it's like pretty core music for me personally. So um, with that, I would say, um, you know, thank you all for this conversation that is probably, if we had unlimited time, we probably would just get the first, like we covered the first 5%. We just kind of set a little bit of a ground and we could go on and on and on and on. Um, but it's wonderful to know that we're all colleagues and still collect connected. Um, so thank you for that, um, Tina and Yuval. Um, we really appreciate your voices today. And Simone, of course, you know this is an ongoing uh, dialogue between you and me, you and Culture Source, you in Southeast Michigan and Detroit. Um, we very much um, thank you for um, being with us today, sharing your ideas, sharing your energy, passion, all the things, um, and look forward to more. With that, I will turn it over to um, my colleague, Adam, who has done a really fantastic job in organizing all of us and all of the events for this residency to offer final remarks. Adam. Uh-oh. Adam, you are muted. It's a rookie. Dang. I just gave you all those compliments, Jim, and you just did the <laughs> most rookie Zoom thing that you could do. Hey, if that's like the biggest love of the three-day residency, I'll take it. So um, thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks again, Simone, for, for joining us. Um, again, for those of you who are working at arts organizations in Southeast Michigan, we'll, we'll be having Simone join our CEO roundtable call at 3.30. Um, so encourage folks to join in on that um, because every moment with Simone is great, as I've said before, and I'll just keep saying it again. Um, thanks again to Tina and Yuval for joining us and Omari for facilitating. We'll be in touch and look out for that email next week with the wonderful playlist, the commission blog post, and just a big recap of this week's residency. Um, until then, stay warm and take care, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.